Come together amid this busy season to take a breath, to breathe in together the life that God gives us, to listen to the beat of God's heart and the blessings and lessons this season brings to us. We live in a time of war and conflict. Nation rises against nation. Rumors of the coming of war and destruction. The deterioration of peace all around us increases our fear, worry, stress, and anxiety. Malachi 3, 1 through 4 says, See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like washer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in former years. We light the second candle of Advent as a symbol of the peace that is not found in earthly rulers, kingdoms, or nations, but is only found in Christ. Peace that transcends all earthly understanding. Our yearning and our waiting are not in vain. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Abby Villagrana, and I am the missions minister here at First Temple. Welcome to First Temple. To everybody, we're so glad you're here. Also, to those, I don't want to forget those who are watching our live stream, thank you so much for joining us in that way. Um, and it's my first time preaching in the classic service, and I'm excited. I've been looking forward to it this whole week. Um, I, know, I recognize that this is an honor, a privilege, and, and I, comes, I come with it with great responsibility. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here and the opportunity to be part of the teaching team, which is very exciting for me. So today, as we've been saying, today is the second Sunday of Advent. We're in the second week. We got three more left. Can you believe that? We're almost near the end of the year. And we, last week, we lit the candle of hope. This week, we, are, we lit the candle of peace. We have remaining of joy and love. And last, um, but very, very much not least, is a Christ candle that leads us into the Christmas season. And I don't know about you guys, but I didn't necessarily grow up with this uh, type of Christian tradition um, in the churches that my dad was a pastor at. But it wasn't until the last three or four years that I've started really practicing this when I moved to Waco and um, practiced Advent with my friends and the churches that I was a part of in Waco. And it's really been a true blessing for me to really not necessarily get into the Christmas spirit. You know, you see all the nice decorations and things that we have going on here. But to really settle in with the fact that Jesus came into this world and the significance that it brings for us and for everybody that is here. And so I hope that as we walk alongside each other for the next few weeks at First Temple, that we can ground each other to that truth as we um, go up to the Christmas uh, Eve service, which I'm really excited. This will be my first one. I hear they're really good. So I hope to see you there. <laughs> hope to see you there. <laughs> Well, today's essential passage is in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. I will read it out loud, say a, quick, uh, say a quick prayer before we begin. So I'll be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. Listen to the word of God for us this morning. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, the name, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. 
So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said this, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Let us pray. God, may the meditation of my heart and the meditation of all of our hearts collectively here in this room be pleasing to you, and may it be edifying for your church here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In these first few verses that we read in, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, we see a people, the Israelites, they were rejecting God's rulership and wanting a human monarch. You know, it's interesting that they are asking for another form of human leadership after it had failed, you know, because we see Samuel's sons had accepted bribes, had been dis were dishonest, and they had perverted justice, but yet they wanted humans again to, a human to replace that leadership. Already, I don't, I don't know if they thought that through about replacing it with the same kind of situation. The leadership of Samuel's sons failed because they were being self-seeking. Now, I don't know exactly what all the web of lies they had created and were keeping up with, but one thing is for sure, they were not considering the community of God. <coughs> They weren't keeping it together or keeping them to committed to follow God. They were making it chaos. But the Israelites wanted to look like the other nations. Verses 11 through 17 paints us a picture of what the warnings of what this king could be. So listen to what Samuel tells them about what it would look like to have a monarch. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them, and, and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. This king, this human monarch, was also going to be self-seeking. Everyone and, and everything was going to belong to him. This king was going to use their sons for war and their daughters for homemaking, and everything and everyone was only going to serve for his purpose and for the caring of his needs. He wasn't going to care about the community and about keeping them committed to God. 
And this is a warning that kind of scares me and that probably should have made him think differently. Verse 18, listen to what verse 18 says. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you on that day. Oof, what a warning, right? It's hard to listen to and I'm sure hard to understand and read. We're gonna put a pin on that real quick and then we'll return to it in a couple moments so that we can read what the response of the Israelites was after they heard all of these warnings. This is what they said in verses 19 through 22. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with the king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people, ha- all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, Listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, Every one of you go back to your own town. What a stubborn people. Definitely does not happen today, right? (laughs) Definitely not. The people heard these warnings, they were told by Samuel, yet they still desired this king. They wanted power and influence. They were seeking self-preservation that was motivated by fear. They were supposed to be a nation, a unique nation, that was committed to each other and committed to the ways of God together. But they rejected God. And God gave them what they were asking for. You see, God allows us to make choices. And sometimes those choices lead lead us to consequences that are not the best thing for us. Do you remember that pin we put in verse 18? Hear it one more time. Verse 18, it says, When that day comes... You will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. I think the perspective we can take when reading this verse is that God was not going to answer them immediately. He wasn't going to answer them at that specific moment that they would cry or when they wanted a response. Because as we know from the rest of the biblical story, God never abandoned his people. Even though his people turned from him time and time again and placed their hope and trust in others. Because you see, God did finally answer to their cry for, from relief of the king they had chosen at his own timing. His plan all along was to send his son, Jesus, Emmanuel, we just sang about him, God with us, to invite us into a different kingdom that is not self-serving or self-seeking. This is what I think this season or part of what the season, the Christmas season invites us to reflect over. Are we still seeking a temporal king that provides us with short-lived assurance? Or are we living into the kingdom of God that is different from anything that this world has to offer and that Jesus pointed to? Have you all ever seen uh, videos of people that are splashing around in water and that they feel like they're drowning? I don't know if you all have seen or can imagine that with me, but that scares me because I don't 
I like respect water. I don't like to swim, nor do I know how to swim. And before you say I can teach you, Abby, I've had plenty of friends throughout the years have tried to teach me, but I just, I can't, I, I can't do it. So anytime these kind of videos or these part, or like, I think I saw this in a cartoon, that they come up, it really like scares me. So like this, the, imagine this image of, of a person uh, in water and, and feeling like they're drowning. So they're, you know, flailing around, trying to reach for whatever is around them. They reach over for a stick and then that stick breaks. And then they reach over for a rock. And then that rock suddenly turns into a turtle and swims away. Can you all imagine that with me? Is that sad? Yeah. And then, and then later you see um, or you hear a voice from the shoreline. And it's a person that yells at them and says, just stand up. <laughs> and they stand up and they realize that they had solid ground under them the whole time. Have you all seen those kind of videos? I don't know if you all seen that. You see, I think that's how we are. We frantically search around for something that's going to provide assurance for us. Then when we grab a hold of something, it suddenly turns into a rock and swims away. You see, we look for assurance in political leaders. We look for assurance in relationships and money. You name it, fill in the blank. But there is a voice that's calling out to us that the kingdom is God, the kingdom of God is right here. It's solid. Jesus' entrance into, into this world has extended this to all of us and provided for us a kingdom that is solid in which we can place our hope and our trust in. This kingdom of God does not look like anything around us because it is now and not yet. Jesus' birth and life announces the kingdom of God now because it invites us to live in a present reality, one where we strive to not look like the world around us. Because this kingdom God's kingdom tells us to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. This kingdom is not made up of the rich and the powerful, but made up of the meek and of the poor. This kingdom is not like the one that the Israelites were asking for and looking for in 1 Samuel of self-preservation and of power and influence. I like what Justo Gonzalez, a Cuban-American historical theologian, says about the kingdom of God now. Hear what he says. The kingdom of God is not just a future hope, but a present reality that brings Jesus' ministry that begins with Jesus' ministry and is actively lived out by Christians through their actions. Because of Jesus' birth into this world, we are invited to walk in his ways, which it sets us free to love our neighbors as generously as he does. But you see, we have to constantly remind ourselves of this present reality because it's not obvious to us. That's why Jesus taught us to pray the phrase, on earth as it is in heaven. It's a daily work for us because what we have learned and what we have read from stories in the Bible, it's so easy for us to slip up and to turn away from God to pursue our own desires. That is why this kingdom of God calls us to repent. That's exactly what Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry in Matthew 4, chapter 1, verse, or chapter 4, verse 17, says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. We repent of our sins and of our own desires, and we also repent of the way of living 
that always searches for the next best thing when we already have the best thing, which is Jesus. Jesus' birth unto this earth points us to the future kingdom of God that is to come, the not yet. Jesus himself says in John 16 that in this world, we will have trouble. He doesn't promise that we won't have it, but he knows that we will have it. But it, it invites us, but he tells us in this verse that it inv he invites us to take heart because Jesus has already overcome everything. This not yet kingdom gives access to everyone who is suffering, who is mourning, and who is grieving to find peace, healing, and joy. Because one day, our tears will be wiped away. I recognize that some of us are entering this season of Christmas and we may be carrying these emotions of suffering, mourning, and grieving. And I don't wanna tell you to put them aside so that you can have a merry and a happy Christmas. But I am inviting you to bring those emotions to Jesus and allow him to carry them with you because while we are here, we can always look towards a future hope in which, in which all of this will be no more. This not yet kingdom can also give us the perspective we need to navigate the challenging and turbulent waters of our society today. One question we might ask that has personally challenged me as I was reading my uh, Advent devotional was, in light of eternity, does this really matter? In light of eternity, does it matter that I have to win every argument against my neighbor who thinks differently than me? Or could I seek ways to connect with my neighbor and to choose to love them? In light of eternity, does it matter if I only place my focus on striving for more in my life? Or could I spend more time with what I have today and find joy in it? My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, which kingdom will you step into? Will you step into a temporary kingdom that is constantly self-seeking? Or will we step into the now and not yet kingdom that through Christ's entrance into this world offers to everyone? Will we frantically swim around trying to grab a hold of anything that seems secure like what the Israelites did when they asked for a king and rejected God? Or will we listen to the voice from the shoreline that is yelling to us to stand up because it is in the hopeful kingdom of God in which we can stand on the now and not yet. Let's pray. God, thank you for promising to be with us and for sending your son to this world to show us the way to live here. God, may we choose to walk in your ways and to walk into your kingdom and not the one that is of this world. May we choose to love and not hate. May we choose to hope in you with our presence hurts because you can help us carry that weight. And God, bless us as we go out of this room to be a light to everyone who we encounter. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.